Welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Odette Grober. Thank you so much for joining me. Today on our program, a conversation with artist Mikael Bowman about his new exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum. Barbara Streisand releases a new duets album. And a look at Israeli's shopping habits for the holidays. Belgian artist Mikael Bowman is considered one of the leading contemporary artists in the world, combining painting, photography and video in challenging new ways. These days he's presenting a comprehensive new exhibition of his works throughout the years at the Tel Aviv Museum. Valeria Bekassis met him to talk about his work. You have exhibited in New York, in Basel. Your last exhibition in Brussels was a success. And now you are in Tel Aviv and you are exhibiting in Tel Aviv Museum. How does it feel to you? This is a new and beautiful museum and I was lucky to do a new exhibition with the same art because it looks very different than my exhibition in Brussels. Can we talk about the return to figurative or neorealism in terms of the public when we see your art and when we know how famous you are around the world? Do you think this is what people want now? I try to do something different with my art, to make a dialogue between my works and with the tradition of the figurative painting. You mean the masters, Goya, Velázquez? It's just one part of my work. But it is important to me because painting is not a unique medium. The medium has a story in our culture, especially in Europe, and for me it is very important to connect with it. What do you mean? Are you talking about the evolution of the painting? What do you mean by medium? It's not a new medium. It's one which is very old and already has a story. You cannot paint without the story. And I try to use this cultural influence in my art. That is why we can see through your art some influences of the masters of painting, such as... Those influences are mostly technical, but I am also inspired by Monet, Leon Spilliard. When I was young, I was really inspired by him, but Marcel Bruters too, because I liked his attitude. When we are looking in your work, we can see a kind of melancholy, sadness in the positions, the profiles. But when I talk with you, I feel you're very agreeable. There is both. There is beauty in painting techniques, and there is also something familiar in my art, in the format, portraying. But in the same time, the treatment can be different. I always try to find or create contradictions in my art, like in life. You've been here in Tel Aviv for a week to prepare your exhibition. In a few minutes it will be open to the public. What did you do around the country since you've been here? Yes, I thought about coming here for this exhibition. I was invited two years ago and I really thought about it because when there is an international cultural boycott like this, there is no boycott, but people are calling it. You know, most of my colleagues are for the boycott, but I wanted to have all the information before making decisions if I am going to exhibit or not. So I did what I had to do. I did some research about the situation, and it is very complex. Most of all, I thought that a cultural boycott is never good. Because when it is happening, all cultural intellectual development is blocked. Uh, 
and it can help develop some bad ideas, and it's not good. It is always better to show art than to not show anything in any situation. You said that you came here to find out your own opinion of the situation here, to understand. What did you understand? What did you discover? I talked with a lot of people, with Palestinian activists and Israeli people, people with different opinions. And the thing that I know is that it is impossible to judge what is happening. I think the main problem is bad communication, and I hope it is only that. Do you think that the information outside is misleading, different from what you see when you are here? Certainly, people try to make things easier to understand, but it is not always the truth. Thank you very much, Michael Borman, and good luck in the future. Beautiful exhibition. Now, uh, Barbara Streisand has uh, just released a new album, Partners, featuring 12 of the world's greatest male vocalists duetting with the legendary singer. Daniel Campos takes a look at this new release. Barbara Streisand is back with a new album. The 72-year-old celebrated musician and two-time Academy Award-winning artist has released her 34th studio album, Partners. The album features Streisand singing duets with an all-male all-star lineup, including Stevie Wonder, John Legend, Michael Bublé, Andrea Bocelli, Billy Joel, Lionel Richie, and even Elvis Presley, even though he's been gone for 37 years. The collection also features Streisand's first studio recorded duet with her son, Jason Gold. There was a place when we were starting While the recordings are new, most of the songs have previously been performed by Streisand. Two classic Streisand duets are updated with new partners, one of them, What Kind of Fool, is newly performed with John Legend, originally done with the late Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees. Singer, actress, activist, and philanthropist, Streisand was included into the French Legion of Honor in 2007, and every time she visits Israel, she's welcomed as one of the most loyal supporters of the country. With her new album, Streisand gives signs that she's not slowing down with her age. Singing and acting bring her a personal happiness and also a great financial reward. Streisand is considered one of the highest priced tour acts of all times, charging fans as much as $1,500 for a single ticket to see her perform live. Streisand isn't shy about her worth, and her fans apparently agree. On uh, Thursday, Scotland will decide whether or not to break away from the United Kingdom, and supporters of uh, Scottish independence have now found unexpected encouragement from the West Bank. Shahal Pelled has more. Bagpipers intensely rehearsing ahead of Scotland's historic vote for independence is an expected sight. But these musicians come from a small town in the Palestinian West Bank and support the Scottish independence campaigners out of solidarity and identification. As a Palestinian, I live under occupation and I know the suffering inflicted by the occupier. So we hope that the Scottish people will live free in a state and an independent entity. Far from the tussle over Scotland's future, pipers and stick-twirling drummers from the predominantly Christian town of Betjala burst into action as local scout troop members march up and down for weekly practice. The scouts insist the bagpipes' Scottish heritage translates perfectly to the Palestinian struggle for their own independence. We play the Palestinian national anthem, Palestinian songs. We express our love for our country. We play the national anthem at every concert, and this is proof of our national pride and a way of expressing it. The Scottish-Palestinian link has a history, with Palestinian flags flown at Glasgow's Celtic Park football stadium since the 1980s. Some Palestinians find the landmark referendum on the fate of the United Kingdom inspirational, as they play what they consider are the instruments of war. Bagpipes express our culture, our heritage. 
This is music that you hear during public events and celebrations, and somehow it represents our culture. As the Scots gear up for what appears to be a knife-edge vote, the supporters could perhaps sense the waves of solidarity thousands of kilometres away. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is around the corner, and along with the apples and honey, gefilte fish and the shofar blowing comes another uh, well-known custom, gift-giving. Writer and uh, cultural commentator Amalia Rosenblum is here to uh, give us a different perspective on the matter. Welcome back, Amalia. Hi, Oded. Thank you. Um, yes, so Rosh Hashanah is about gift giving. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, we need to think about it from an anthropological perspective. Gift giving is really a means by which we strengthen social and family ties because really they bring us into uh, a sense of uh, obligation, mutual obligation. And, and uh, guilt tripping. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> where would the holidays be, you know, without guilt tripping? <laughs> and it can be any gift, though, to, to, to get the, the the right kind of guilt trip from the other person. You're right, and I think actually you're right on the mark because uh, in recent years we've seen gifts in the holidays become more extravagant, people think, you know, putting more effort uh, into them and more thought and getting things that, you know, lo no longer could you like march into, you know, your uh, host house and bring in just a locally made wine. You had to go to either design shops or get some exclusive kitchenware, really? uh, jewelry, exactly, I yes. I should invite you uh, uh, over more often. Well, the, yeah, well, the thing <laughs> is that uh, I think this is actually not going to happen this year, so I don't know if you should invite me, maybe this that, year. yeah. How come? Because I do think that the recent summer and the recent events that yeah. we've had here have really depressed the mood in Israel, yeah. and not just uh, the spirit. I think also, you know, a lot of self-employed people have suffered uh, fi financially, financially. Yeah, exactly. Certainly. And summer is, you know, time of uh, lots of expenses for parents, and going back to school comes with its own price tag. Mm -hmm. And really, people have a smaller budget, but I think also we feel more introspective. I think we've mellowed a little bit and we're not going to see the same kind of stuff. I think probably. So, what are we going to see? Is it back to basics, back to a bottle of wine? And a bottle of wine, um, I think perhaps the, you know, the, there's the gourmet honey or what have you, but also books. I think books perhaps uh, might be making a you comeback know, a of comeback sorts. of yeah, sorts. It used to be the obvious gift. Uh, Totally, but they've suffered uh, some sort of um, uh, downgrade because yeah. uh, because of the way they've been promoted. Well, that, that's a whole subject in and of itself. It's a whole subject, but I do think that now with the you know with like the more introspective spirit and atmosphere, that we might be coming back to that. And how does that fit with with the holiday spirit? Because you know, for Christmas, I'm not sure you could you could do that uh, that switch. Exactly, I think you're right, but I do I do think that we have in a way uh, something that's uh, that's very true to the original spirit of the holiday because unlike Christmas, I mean, Rosh Hashanah, of course, is a, you know, supposed to be a merry time. Mm -hmm. Yet Rosh Hashanah, together with Yom Kippur, are holidays that uh, tend to focus on people's relationship with God. There, these are times of reflection. These are times when uh, we try to think about our actions and prepare ourselves for the new year. So any gift that's going to uh, keep in line with that is actually going to be even truer. I mean, I don't know who, you know, came up with the holidays, but truer to the <laughs> original meaning. So we're not as commercial as, as America just yet. Um, and maybe the, the spirit of the holiday of Rosh Hashanah will keep us uh, uh, as, at safe distance from that. Thank you so much, Amalia. Thank you. We are almost done for today. Please remember to look us up online, i24news.tv. You can also find us on uh, Facebook and on Twitter. But before we end, nine years after their lip-syncing video has gone viral, Israelis Lital Meisel and Adi Frimerman have come full circle. Back then, they took the world by storm with their version of the Pixies song, Hey! Even director Kevin Smith made his own video tribute at the time. When the band performed in Israel earlier this year, the band members met Lital and Adi, and now the two were hired to direct the Pixies' new video for their song, Ring the Bell. So let's end with that. Here it is, Ring the Bell. Ring the bell.